Good afternoon and thanks for joining us today. My name is Costas Panos. I'm professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at UC Berkeley and director of Citrus and the Banato Institute. I would like to welcome you to the 14th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. And uh, in this series, we actually have hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators in person and are glad to see you all joining virtually today for the spring of 2022. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today you are joined by Derek Hollenbeck. Derek is a PhD student in the mechanical engineering program at UC Merced that is advised by Dr. Yang Quan Chen. Derek's research is focused on the use of small uncrewed aerial systems, SUAS, both multi-rotor and fixed wing aircraft as scientific data instruments to solve certain localization related issues of fugitive methane, which can affect the environment and public safety. He's interested in the use of SUAS swarms, fractional calculus, and exploring how to make collective systems such as swarms more adaptive for these search problems. Derek started his interest in SUS through the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Astronautics helping to pioneer UC Merced's first two appearances in the AIAA Design Build Fly event. He's also a lab manager for mechatronics, embedded systems, and automation, or uh, otherwise known as the MESA lab. So it is my great honor to introduce Derek. Derek, we'll be glad to hear your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Custis. Um, and I wanna, I wanna first thank uh, all the organizers um, for inviting me to give this presentation. So the title of this proposal that we submitted for the Citrus Aviation Prize is called LeapFrog. And you might be wondering what the acronym stands for. Um, Let's see, there we go. Um, so it stands for Long Endurance Edge AI Platform for Research Opportunities and Data Gathering. And so I think with all good projects, you need a, you need a good acronym. So I'm, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, it's gonna begin a little bit with the team background. Uh, and we're gonna go into the competition rules, um, design requirements. And then we'll talk about the, our proposal that we submitted and then do a little recap on some of the judges' feedback, uh, and then where the current team is sitting, or at least uh, new members, uh, where we're at in current progress, and, um, and then some future planning. And so on the image on the right here uh, is a picture of some of our team members. So from left to right, we have Kenneth Pruitt, Ambrose Liu, Falana Ng, uh, Deanne, How You Knew, and uh, myself, uh, and then who's not shown is Jim uh, Solomon and our faculty advisors, Spencer Castro and uh, Ying Quan Chen. So the team background, we're pretty diverse. We have several folks in the mechanical engineering department, electrical engineering, computer science. Um, we also have some undergraduates in the computer science um, in the uh, psychology department and as well as the management of complex systems. Um, so I just wanna highlight some research from our lab. Um, so my research, like Kostas was explaining, focuses on methane sniffing drones. And so I have a picture here uh, of a mission uh, or flight campaign that we did out in Alberta, Canada, uh, trying to compare the use of drones against um, existing technologies from vehicle or on foot measurements. Uh, for active uh, oil and gas sites. Um, also, How You Knew, which uh, does research in um, uh, precision agriculture, has you know experience in dealing with image segmentation. So this is dealing with how to best follow in between a crop. Um, and so how do we you know segment the space so we do not tell the controller of the, the ground robot where to go as well as he does work in evapotranspiration, so remote sensing. This is a, of a pomegranate field. And I also wanna note, uh, Kenneth Pruitt has some experience dealing with measuring uh, dust particulates, uh, namely PM 2.5, uh, using a, um, a multi-rotor platform. Okay, so for the competition, we had several rules for designing and implementing a flight, uh, namely that can go 115 miles. And 
travels within a circuit of at least five miles in circumference. And I want to probably make a disclaimer here that when we initially wrote the proposal, we sort of thought that it has to be within a five mile circumference. So keep that in mind as, as we move forward. Uh, so to do this, it's going to require several things. The first being that we need to have some uh, Part 107 compliance. Uh, this includes operations over people. Uh, long endurance platform, so that has a 45 minute reserve. And so this makes it very challenging. Uh, we need a proposed flight path and an environmental survey. We have to have three control handoff points. So this is transferring uh, remote pilot and command control um, uh, using or and a mobile control point. We also need to have um, a 4G slash 5G communication system. And we need autonomous emergency landing, obstacle avoidance, as well as a risk matrix or emergency mitigation plan. And all of this has to be done within a $25,000 budget. So the FAA, in, court, in order to uh, operate legally, we have to sort of meet uh, several requirements. So for the mobile control point, we, we can select areas that are sparsely populated and we won't have to apply for any waivers. Additionally, if we were to actually fly over people, we would need to uh, apply for a waiver. And so in this demonstration flight or um, uh, competition, we're sort of aiming to put all of the pieces in place uh, such that we can potentially apply for this waiver in the future. So to begin the concept of operations of the proposal, and we wanted to begin thinking about the environmental survey. And so this started with the target area. And so for us, we looked towards the Merced Vernal Pools and Grassland Reserve. And so the image on the right shows uh, what, what it looks like when it gets a little bit of rain and then also what it looks like when everything dries out. And so they're, these vernal pools are rich uh, in research and mainly they also have endangered species such as the fairy shrimp or the tadpole shrimp and the uh, tiger salamanders. But we also picked this because of its location. So it's located just north, um, northeast of the campus. It covers a very large area and what's shown on the image is there's these numbers. These are actually uh, cattle grazing lots. And as talking with the reserve director, um, one of the challenges was how to improve their active cattle grazing program. And so one of the research questions we wanted to identify was how do we quantify something called residual dry matter, which they're using as a metric um, to uh, improve, hopefully improve their adaptive crowd grazing. So moving uh, forward, we obviously can't survey this whole area because it's much, much too large. So we wanted to instead focus on a subset. And so within that subset was these lots six and four, which are very close to campus and it allows for um, easier access for people to view. We can utilize dirt roads in a sparsely populated area. So this allows for us to meet the FAA Part 107 requirement. And we decided to break this flight into three legs. Um, the first is a cruising leg. So this would essentially be um, a flight where we can just run laps. This, this is for testing the endurance and maintaining visual line of sight. We have a routing leg. So this allows us to operate from a moving vehicle along the road um, in a, such a way that the aircraft does not outpace the moving vehicle. And so we've experimented with this with some extended visual line of sight testing. Uh, the survey leg would be essentially um, a 200 acre survey in a, one of these or just next to uh, the end of lot six here. And then to do this, we have to set up a series of control handoff points where we would hand off from the cruising leg to let's say the mobile leg or routing leg um, and from the routing leg to the environmental survey and then back. So in order to carry this out, we need mission planning tools. And so we've looked at 
two in particular, one would be mission planner, which is shown to the right. And the other is Q ground, ground control. And they vary um, in sort of uh, some of the uh, software on the back end. But just to show for the viewers that uh, you would end up with a lot of information about the health of the aircraft and mainly the pose. So let's say if we want to know the bank angle, the heading direction, what altitude we're at, battery status, uh, these all these things that will be cr critical for the folks that are operating the ground control station to relay that to the pilot in command. We're also considering the use of ROS, Ardupilot, and Gazebo. I mean, Gazebo is a simulating environment that a lot of folks use um, in robotics to test out control systems. And so for doing software in the loop testing, um, putting obstacles in there to see if, about obstacle avoidance, this is um, a good place for that. So just to kind of zoom in on the different flight legs, uh, this would be an example of how you can uh, develop it using waypoints. Um, this is just a very simple example, um, could be larger, of course. But you would have a control handoff point within this uh, leg. If you take off, you can get to altitude. Um, it doesn't show quite in the scale, but you can have a loiter point where you'll loiter for a set period of time. Uh, once you're ready to transition, the aircraft will move to a control handoff point where it'll loiter a set uh, number of times. At this point, you would make sure that the next pilot in command would have control of um, RC control of the aircraft before you would go into this routing leg. And so the routing leg again would do this back and forth pattern. This is to uh, avoid outpacing the mobile vehicle that would go along the road. And then again, once you get to the other control point, the aircraft we put in a loiter until the next pilot in command can take over and then the survey can be conducted. I think it's important to note that for the survey, there's several patterns that you can look at. Uh, this one here is just a um, raster scanning or lawnmower pattern. However, there are things like the sliding um, racetrack that skips a, ra a, a leg. So that way you don't have to make a um, very big lead in and, um, and lead out. And I'll, it'll be clear when I show the next slide, which is when you do software in the loop. So for software in the loop, you see that we can have a, um, this kind of puts together most of the, um, the legs that I just discussed, but for the survey leg, you can see that the aircraft has to uh, go outside of the survey target area, make a big loop, straighten up before it actually gets back into the, um, uh, survey area. And this is critical for getting good data for the actual uh, environmental survey. And so an example of the control handoff scheme um, would be that you would check to see if you're going to finish a leg. Um, if so, then you're going to put it in loiter. Um, if the, the pilot is ready, then we'll go ahead and switch uh, the GCS which ground control station um, and make sure that the, the pilot is confirmed before they start the new leg. Um, if not, then it's going to get stuck in a loop until the pilot's ready. Um, and if anything else happens, then we can always return to launch and land the aircraft. Which brings us to the aircraft platform. So after looking at several, um, several platforms online, one that met most of the requirements uh, and within the budget as well, was this Foxtech AYK250. And we've opted for the Pro for some reasons that we'll explain later, but this is a ready to fly platform. It comes with an eight kilometer range controller. Um, it has a three and a half hour flight time and it has a, you know, a decent stall speed and a decent cruising speed. So we, ideally you wanna, for the, I guess the uh, environmental survey, if we can fly slower, um, it's better in terms of getting uh, the, the amount of overlap you need for the remote sensing survey. 
the maximum takeoff is 3.5 kilograms, and then the typical weight is 12.5. So this gives us about uh, 1.2 kilogram payload. Um, I think there's a number that should be off there. So I wanted to point out some other key features that will come into play with this aircraft. So it has a center of gravity measuring ring, and this can be useful for when we put in uh, other sensors and equipment uh, for balancing the aircraft. And for those that fly fixed wing aircraft, you know that a poorly balanced aircraft is not ideal and, and it also could be quite dangerous. Um, the, this has a nice flight control compartments located at the five bullet point five there. Um, and this could also serve as um, a potential place for a parachute or, and the parachute could be connected to these uh, CG measuring rings as well. And then that will um, stabilize the aircraft during descent if we have to put a parachute on it. It has a detachable payload compartment. So this is uh, good for, you know, designing swappable payloads uh, in the future. So for different missions. And just for scale, uh, it shows a, a person holding the aircraft. So it is quite large um, compared to, you know, some smaller UAVs, but it's not at the civil UAV um, range. Okay, so a high level system overview, right? So we have the VTOL propulsion, which is a, um, it's like a quad rotor. Uh, it has the battery com uh, are housed in the nose of the aircraft. We have um, proximity sensors that would be placed, ideally uh, pointed outward uh, horizontally uh, and possibly down. The, the forward flight, it's a tail pusher. So it's the, the rear of the aircraft, you have uh, the main forward flight motor and all the payload cameras will be set up underneath. And so this, this aircraft uses what's called rudder vaders. And so it uses a mixing between this elevator rudder action. So it allows for the aircraft to do all of those operations. So to yaw the aircraft and then also to pitch the, um, the nose up or down. So to get into a little bit of the specifics uh, about the avionics, uh, this was the initial um, avionics layout in the proposal. And it consists with, uh, let me get a laser pointer here. So it consists mainly around the auto, the Pixhawk autopilot. And so one of the requirements was that we need to um, communicate or have a ability to do this obstacle avoidance emergency landing. So we need a way to um, control the autopilot uh, on board. So we, we opted for a Raspberry Pi as a co-pilot system, and this would essentially communicate over a MAVROS or MAV proxy a serial connection locally on board the aircraft. And so we can utilize something like a state machine to switch between modes, uh, and then also takes in information from the um, this, uh, proximity sensors. Uh, and then, for things like emergency landing or anything that needs some machine learning or um, computer vision uh, computations, we're looking at the Intel Neural Compute Stick as an option. On the Pixhawk side, we can utilize some of the features within the servo rail system. So we can switch, use that to trigger an RC switching uh, mechanism that would switch between uh, radio um, RC receivers of the to the individual uh, individual um, remote pilot in command. So this is for the control handoff. Also, uh, triggering although it doesn't have to be, but triggering can be done uh, using this um, to to the payload cameras as well. And so, I'll point it out here is that we're looking in the beginning. We looked at uh, Map IR with red, green, blue, and a near-infrared camera. Uh, but I'll show you in the next uh, few slides um, that we've opted to change that to reduce weight. 
The last thing I'll point out, or last two things, is the the LT module that would bridge the normal uh, transceiver to the GCS um, would be done using the CUAV um, LTE link system. However, from the time of the proposal to the time we started looking at purchasing, they no longer, they discontinued the product and they've actually made a different product that also includes HD video. So it could be better, but it's also about $1,000 a piece. And so it's finding difficult to fit it into the budget. So uh, after talking with some of the other team, we're considering on utilizing what we were gonna do is use a six fab uh, 4G shield on the Raspberry Pi. This would communicate over 4G and the serial connection can just be um, bridged through a uh, 4G based uh, server to the to the ground. Okay. So for the payload camera, we're looking at now a map IR orange cyan near infrared. And so it focuses on the near infrared band, the orange and cyan bands. And the reason why is because we can use this OCN camera to see uh, drier vegetation. So here on the bottom, you got an RGB image, and then you have a uh, comparison with the OCN camera. And then on the top, you have a red, green, near infrared image. And so there's some improvements to that. Um, and it also reduces about 70 grams in the overall payload. All right, so the, the ancillary and peripheral sensors we're looking at, the first being the emergency landing. So we're gonna use a Raspberry Pi and this just makes it convenient because the Raspberry Pi is gonna do a lot of the computation in terms of the emergency landing. And then we're also considering several types of camera sensors for the obstacle avoidance. The first one we were looking at was stereo camera. And we were gonna use that with the vector field histogram approach. This is gonna be a more custom, but I've also seen this being used as a horizontal um, proximity sensor. The, the two sensors on the right here are, um, there's, um, they're ultrasonic ranging sensors and these can be placed around the aircraft. Um, RDU Pilot supports several um, sensors, which one of them is a 360 degree LiDAR, which I think is suitable more for, um, for multi-rotors, but it also supports up to nine range finders. So the, range, the ultrasonic ranging could be a, a good strategy. However, we're gonna use our testing and testing strategy to pick the best one. And so I just wanted to also show, um, since this was in the original proposal, the vector field histogram. And so the idea was to use the stereo camera facing downward that can pick out obstacles and essentially using the feedback from the stereo camera can um, give us a control input that we can then feed to the autopilot in terms of maybe a desired waypoint to move the aircraft away from the obstacle. However, using the autopilot pre-built built-in um, functions we, we showed on the previous slide could be a better option considering the time constraints. Okay, so the emergency landing system, just to give a high-level overview, would be uh, a VTOL mode only task, and we're considering it more of as a computer vision task to detect roads. Uh, and then we want to use segmentation to find low risk areas. And what we mean by that is if we have the downward facing camera as we're in VTOL mode to, uh, to, to land, we don't want to land on the vernal pools because this could be bad for the ecology there, but also could be bad for uh, in case there's a fire or something and it gets pretty dry out there. So the idea would be that we can come up with a control algorithm to either ascend or uh, we know something about where the roads are located to find the road, detect it. Uh, then we can use a segmentation task to segment where the road is. The road would be labeled a low risk and everything else would be high risk. And you would want to try to center the low risk areas as you land to pick the, the best location. Now, there's several ideas how you can do this. Um, 
And one idea is you can use a deep convolutional network. We can train this offline to do the segmentation, and then it can be deployed, uh, like I mentioned earlier, on an Intel neural compute stick. So that way, this offloads some of the computational task of the um, of the Raspberry Pi. So to meet the FAA Part 107 requirements to get the aircraft below 100 or 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy, we need some parachute. So this is, in this scenario, if the aircraft needed to be terminated and we, or something happened with the power, we need to be able to deploy a parachute to slow it down so it doesn't have this impact energy. But when we first started looking at this, the uh, fruity shoots, uh, one of the ones that is designed for an aircraft of our size will only let it descend at about 15 feet per second. So the other issue is that the system weight is about 780 grams. So we eat up a lot of our payload capacity. The next is the impact energy. So if you compute the impact energy given this 15 foot pounds actually will hit the ground um, and all the energy is transferred, this is much too great um, to meet the requirement. And so to give you another sort of viewpoint, uh, this is what the curve looks like for the energy. And so if you have, if the aircraft was 14 pounds with this parachute, we would still be at 23 foot pounds. So there's no, there's no seemingly way to beat this by just adding in more parachutes. So one of the options we were considering was to look at an airbag. Um, this company Manta Air um, offered or has a solution for this, although they never got back to us. So we reached out to another company called APCO Aviation, and they're willing to design a lightweight airbag. Um, and they've offered uh, sink rates that are 20 to 30% better than fruity shoots. Although we're still in a design phase to figure out what's the best solution for this, um, for this task. So to answer the risk um, uh, mitigation and contingency plan, we looked at this more from an operational perspective. So if you're in flight and we have a system performance issue, we would want a way to um, assess that. And so we would first assess if there's impact to safety or if there's safety is compromised. If there is no impact to safety, then we might wanna monitor the flight performance or maybe we have to modify some of the uh, flight operations. So maybe if the aircraft's not flying good, um, we can just trim it and then it'll fly straight. Or if the safety is compromised, we sort of have to ask the question, is it controllable or is it not controllable? If it's controllable, we can return it to launch and recover the aircraft. If it's uncontrollable, then we would be forced to terminate the flight. And this is where the parachute and airbag system comes into play. In addition, there are several fail safes built into the PIXOC and Arter Pilot system that deal with um, the C2 link loss. And so C2 stands for command and control. So this is the, um, the ground control telemetry signal. And so you have usually two, one's called a short and a long. So you can do things if for a short uh, fail safe, you just tell the aircraft to loiter until uh, the signal is connected again. If the signal doesn't connect, then the aircraft will return to launch. Um, ideally, if there's no you know, serious failure within the communication system, you'll recover the signal during this time. Uh, the safety link is the RC um, link that the pilot in command would have. And so if this fails while the pilot is operating, this is, would trigger an RC fail safe. And so this doesn't return to launch as well. And then there's other things like a geofence um, and then also a GPS link, um, which is more of an advanced failsafe that you can terminate the flight. So the budget that we submitted, um, this is a, a high level overview of it. We tried to compartmentalize it partly due to um, page limits, but it's comprised of the aircraft, the peripheral sensors, um, the AirLink 4G. This is before they switched the 
the hardware on us, the co-pilot system, uh, parachute system. We were looking at ADSBN. I didn't talk about it, but this would be giving us access to local aircraft in the air. But it's my understanding that the AYK-250, the orange cube, also has ADSB in capabilities. Uh, and then the map IR we had swapped out. And so some of the other things related to operation would be additional RC controllers, uh, additional RC receivers, and then perhaps a off highway vehicle for dealing with the mobile control point. Um, so our budget, we we've definitely have a lot of room to play with our budget. Um, although the weight, we are very close to the max weight. And I think we could go a little bit over here, but uh, we wanna try to stay with within that 13.5 um, kilograms, and just so we can keep the endurance very high. Okay, so the initial timeline looks something like this. And we initialized, we wanted to get the platform in January, February, start to integrate. Uh, we wanted to develop the co-pilot system out, and uh, our PIC switching, remote pilot and command, and then deal with obstacle avoidance and emergency landing testing software in the loop, of course, first, and then move that to more hardware in the loop testing uh, and testing airworthiness of the platform before a field demonstration in May. Okay, moving to the judges' feedback, uh, we received, you know, a lot of good criticism. Uh, the first being that we could plan a larger surface area for the survey plan. The parachute and airbag system, we didn't really consider laceration. Uh, the budget didn't consider batteries uh, and or travel, food, although the, the site is located at campus. And so we, I think it's a fair point still. Um, the emergency landing system was ambitious. I'd give them that. Um, and then more members uh, that have more expertise. So since then, we have opted to expand this area now to about 600 meters. Um, we need to do some more testing to make sure that uh, the cruising leg will still meet the um, 115 mile requirement. Uh, we opted for the AYK250 Pro. Now this Pro has self-locking propellers. So in case of a flight termination where we would uh, deploy the parachute and airbag system, the um, propellers will lock, so they're no longer spinning. Um, the, the advantage of this also helps with endurance of the aircraft. Uh, we purchased three sets of batteries, um, and then uh, we're also working with the Citrus community, um, or starting to work with the Citrus community here. And so uh, with that, I'll show you flash all of the added members that we're currently working with. And so we've been talking with UC Santa Cruz over the past couple of weeks. Um, and just recently we started to talk with uh, UC Davis folks and uh, one UC Berkeley. And so we're looking forward to this collaboration. And I wanna give a high level overview of how I think this is going to connect um, in between the campuses. And I, I sort of lumped UC Davis and Berkeley together here. Um, but UC Merced would focus on the obstacle avoidance, emergency landing, perhaps drop testing. We're collaborating with the UC Santa Cruz folks on a parachute and airbag system. Um, UC Santa Cruz would focus on the 4G communication, control handoff. And UC Davis, considering their flight experience, would look at aircraft readiness, mission planning, um, and then field testing could be done sort of collaboratively between the Merced and Davis folks. Okay, so the current progress we're at is now we've purchased or attempted to purchase the aircraft batteries, spare propellers, payload camera, this 4G LT shield for the, pick, uh, the Raspberry Pi and the, the sensors for uh, the proximity uh, ranging. and some of the items still left to purchase would be the airbag system, which we're still developing, the um, RC transmitter receivers. Um, we wanted to make sure that the transmitter receiver that comes with the aircraft will meet the needs. 
before we purchase more of them um, and to find out that they won't work. The RPIC switching device needs to be developed with the parts list. Um, and then some of the stereo camera and Raspberry Pi have been challenging to buy because they're not in stock. But we also have some in the lab that we want to play with before we consider um, purchasing. Uh, as of last week, we received most of the, the spare parts and other um, things in our per first purchase. However, the aircraft and batteries are currently stuck in procurement and uh, we're, we're working on that to get that as soon as possible. And this makes our timeline get adjusted quite a bit. And so now we're expecting maybe the aircraft March or April. Um, so all of the things have to kind of be shifted to the right. And so we're looking at now maybe demonstrating in June. And it's to my understanding that this may work better for UC Berkeley folks who are not on uh, the semester system. Okay, um, so what's planning ahead is, is hardware, software, payload, safety testing. So we, for obstacle avoidance and emergency landing, we wanna confirm the sensor range response. Uh, emergency landing, we need to test and validate machine learning models, currently working on data sets uh, generating the payload, uh, we want to confirm that the remote sensing strategy will work. And so the, the landscape in the vernal pools is very homogenous. And so this, to my understanding, is uh, makes it challenging to do the, um, the ortho mosaic um, that's needed for collecting the data. Although we could put um, targets out there for the stitching. Um, and then the, the drop testing. So we want to test different um, uh, try to get an understanding of what kind of airbag we would need or what the surface area, even if it's possible to get to this 11 foot pounds given the mass of the aircraft. And so a preliminary um, idea of how this can happen is, you know, considering this, uh, considering you have a rigid object and you drop it, the kinetic energy would be uh, roughly the same as a non-rigid object where the mass is the same. However, the densities could be different and the surface area at impact could be different. So if they impact the surface, they will, they will indent the surface. Um, and this indentation um, is related to the crushing strength of the material. And so this uh, volume or volume one, it would be proportional to the kinetic energy. So if it's a rigid object where you would assume that all of the energy goes into the material. And then for the kinetic energy of the second object would be roughly equal to this ratio. So if we don't uh, include the same amount of volume, we can sort of infer that this kinetic energy would be uh, reduced and so, this can be done with an airbag as well to see if we can get to that 11 foot pounds. Uh, for the project planning, uh, we also are considering go, no go checklists. And so this is pretty standard for folks that do missions. Um, this would be considering a departure checklist. So flight bags, uh, field testing equipment, fire extinguisher, spare parts, components, batteries, et cetera a pre-flight checklist. So making sure all the GPS, compass, accelerometers, payload, all this stuff is working nicely, uh, no errors. In-flight procedures, so this would be communication, regular intervals. So your GCS would be telling you what the battery status is, what's the airspeed, ground speed, what is the, um, what flight stage are you in? Are you in a loiter mode? Or are you going to go up to a waypoint? Um, and then post-flight checklist. So this is, is the aircraft safe to approach? Are the, is it the motors disarmed? Uh, this sort of thing. Uh, we're also dealing with several challenges and risks, right? So the, as I mentioned earlier, supply chain. So some items became unavailable or were hardware change or they're back ordered, not available. Um, software and hardware, like sometimes the software has issues with compatibility or people put updates uh, and then it bricks your code and that is a real issue. Also computing power on the edge. So considering the emergency landing system, uh, this could be 
challenging or it could slow down um, the the loop of of you know taking the image, doing the segmentation task, and then coming back with the low risk area. Um, for payload capacity and design requirements, this is an issue because the parachute takes up a lot of our payload. And so there's a, this, this balance between making sure we can meet all those design requirements and also leaving some room to have usable research equipment. And then we also have, of course, human injury, whether this is electrical, like we're dealing with high power or high current devices and uh, physical, you know, you have moving propellers and other things that could cause injury. Uh, and of course, you know, the loss of a drone, which has been more of a financial um, thing. And so the last thing I'll leave you guys with is the targeted mission deliverables. So this would be standard operating procedures, uh, functioning leapfrog platform, a list of lessons learned, because there's obviously those. Uh, research data, so hopefully the, this will give us some residual dry, mat, dry matter estimates, as well as workforce training. So a lot of the undergraduates, I think, will get a lot of hands-on experience with this. And with that, I will welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Derek. That's a very exciting presentation. Glad uh, you people are making so much progress. I just would like to add that the way we design this uh, with a view in the future to, for in future, you know, semesters or years to see this capability expand, you know, and start doing perhaps missions uh, between campuses. Uh, we are open to questions. And uh, uh, so, so maybe, uh, so I can see here a question, a question about uh, the genesis of the Citrus Aviation Prize. So maybe I can talk to, to, to this about for, for a second. Uh, it has two objectives. One objective, of course, is to engage students. And uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, Derek and his team are fully engaged. And I'm even more glad to see the other teams, uh, the other teams engaging as well uh, in order to making this, you know, a true cross-campus team effort to make it happen. Uh, I also, I'm also glad to see that uh, the way it was designed was, uh, seems doable, but also quite reasonably challenging, right? Many things that you guys need to invest and consider. It is not something I can just buy off the shelf and fly. There's quite a bit of work that has to happen with that. Uh, but uh, the, other, the other reason we, we came up with the aviation price and the reason we designed the way it was, as I mentioned a moment ago, is that we initially thought that we'll uh, uh, challenge people for the autonomous flight between campuses. The, if you wonder where this magic number 115 miles came about, that's the distance, uh, you know, flight distance between UC Davis, UC Merced. And we thought that we will do that. Of course, uh, the moment we start looking at part 105 and various regulations and limitations, uh, then we realized that uh, the requirement to stay within uh, line of sight Will not make this possible in the near term. In the future, we might be able to request for for an exception, or, you know, from the FAA to do that. So we want to build capability that we can keep building year after year, semester after semester, in order to get to the point that we can do some uh, actually truly impressive flights. Even though this one is going to be impressive on its own right. Um, so that's 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 a part of the genesis of the of the Citrus Aviation. I would like to acknowledge. Uh, that in this particular example, in the Citrus Aviation Prize, we had considerable friend, you know, help from many people, including for, for, uh, for the Institute of Transportation Studies, uh, ITS, and uh, the then director and, and still friend, you know, Alex Bayan, you know, played quite a bit for all of that. So I'm glad to open it to other questions that might be available. And I don't know if Peter, you want to contribute something. I'm happy to post this. Uh, I'm Peter Glenn. I'm the uh, project coordinator here for Citrus Aviation. Um, just curious uh, if you, uh, Derek, great to hear you're collaborating with other students um, from other campuses. Can you can you tell a little bit more about how that collaboration came to be and how it's been going so far? Yeah, great question. So, well, some of the collaboration, I think, was connected mainly through the, the Citrus community folks, a lot of you leadership. Um, and so we've been trying to communicate over Slack. Um, and it's been a little slow. It's the beginning. Uh, 
to start, but I, we've been picking up and we're trying to set up more regular meeting intervals and um, and uh, I'm currently actually working on getting some some hardware that uh, that Mesa Lab is going to loan over to the UC Santa Cruz folks to, to start developing so they have some stuff in hand. Um, but yeah, so we mainly using like Slack and trying to get, you know, I guess, I guess it's challenging and then having a lot of people to sort of navigate can be a very challenging task in itself too. But uh, yeah, that's the main channel we're using right now. And a lot of it, this connection has been um, only possible uh, thanks to the Citrus management. Uh, Derek, I have, I have a kind of a technical question. Uh, in the specification of the challenge, we require that the system is, is capable of vertical takeoff and landing. Mm -hmm. and, and of course you meet the requirements by picking this platform, but uh, looking at your presentation, I'm sure it occurs to you, this uh, VTOL system uh, really uh, contributes quite a bit to what would have been useful payload, right? If you didn't have this uh, quadcopter you know, assembly on that, uh, then you, you could exchange that with payload. And uh, many of these autopilots that you have discussed are fully capable of autonomous, you know, takeoff and landing for fixed wing systems without a vital capability. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, would you consider, and given the area that you're flying, that would have been quite feasible even for emergency landing, right? To, to glide someplace as opposed to do the VTOL. Um, any thoughts on um, that for future? Of future uh, evolution? Yeah, so I guess this is more of, yeah, so this is a tough question because initially when we were trying to assess this problem, if you're going to consider emergency landing in a forward flight mode, this means that you would need some, uh, we would need access to the control of the aircraft or we would need a faster control loop. Um, I see. And I think this, Considering the time frame, right? Um, it, this probably developed. You know, we need more custom autopilot, or we need we need direct access to the states, so we have better control. Um, mm -hmm. So th this would uh, entail perhaps um, um, an altitude controller and other things to make the landing. I do think it's possible. Like we can just pick a spot, but um, I mean, this is still challenging because considering. Um, uh, you, how fast that you're moving, the decisions that you make, uh, you can't really, you know, make too many decisions before you start to actually go towards the ground. So mm -hmm. there's like an envelope of time that that you have to work within, and, and I think this makes it quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we opted for this um, VTOL only mode because it made sense that because we have the capability. And then it allows for us to have a slower control loop and, and we can assess, you know, where to, where to land, you know, make a control input, reassess and then make a control input. And then, mm -hmm. but um, I suppose, like you said, if, if you do have to land in forward flight, maybe at that point you can just um, pull the ripcord, so to speak, and terminate the flight. And that would mm -hmm. deploy the parachute and airbag system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a good point. It's it's challenging. <laughs> Maybe that's the short answer. Um, Thank you, Derek. Uh, I see a question that popped up on the Q&A panel. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Derek. If you not, let me read it. Uh, it comes from John. What kind of ground resolution are you expecting to get from the flight system? Will the reserve staff uh, collect ground data to connect with image during the dry season? Um, so uh, yeah, I'm still trying to you know learn the exact ground truth data collection for the residual dry matter. Um, so this is ongoing, trying to figure this one out. Uh, I think the resolution is going to depend on the field of view of the camera and the uh, and the uh, height of the aircraft. So we're trying to, in order for safety reasons, we're going to try to fly at that 400 feet. Um, level so that way mm -hmm. if a parachute needs to be deployed it would give us ample time to, to deploy mm -hmm. the parachute but um i want to say i don't know if i would quote me on this but i think it's around centimeter range in terms of the pixel resolution but um 
for the ground truth comparison, this is something I'm still, I still need to uh, learn more about. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is on my to-do list. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay, Derek. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we learned a lot. Glad to see that there's so much progress being made. And uh, we'll be looking forward for your updates and looking forward to come and watch the flight and celebrate with you. So, uh, and I uh, would like to remind you all that uh, we'll be reconvening for this uh, seminar next week, same time noon on the, on the, on the 2nd of uh, March on guiding the University of California's responsible use of AI. So I hope to see you all then. Again, thank you, Derek. Thank you, thank you all for attending. Thank you guys for inviting me. Okay.